3D animation has become a standard toolset in post-production, but working in 3D seems as technically complex as ever. Half the battle is getting your head around the counterintuitive process of working with three-dimensional objects on a flat computer screen. The other half is simply understanding all the bizarre technical terms that come with the territory. Well, that's why you're watching this video. In the next few minutes, we'll cover off the most important concepts and terms so that you can ease your way into the environment of just about any 3D-enabled software out there. First, let's clarify the term 3D itself. 3D can either refer to computer-generated three-dimensional objects or to stereoscopic images that present a different perspective of a scene to the left and right eyes, creating the illusion of stereo depth. Since this is quite confusing, many people choose instead to call 3D animation CG, short for computer generated, and movies and images with independent left and right eye views, stereoscopic 3D. Oh, and if you hear the term CGI, that's just an old school way of saying CG. For simplicity, we'll use the term 3D animation to refer to the entire discipline of making 3D computer generated things. We need to start by talking about coordinate spaces. 3D scenes are represented by three axes, typically labeled X, Y, and Z. One axis represents the horizontal direction, another the vertical direction, and a third the depth of the scene. By the way, you'll often hear the vertical axis referred to as the up axis. As an example, we've labeled our horizontal axis X our vertical Y, and our depth axis Z. The point where the three axes meet is called the origin. That's where X, Y, and Z all have a value of zero. Now, if we take an object and place it at the origin, we can say that it's at the position zero, 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 since the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the center of our object are all zero. Now, let's say we move our object two units to the right. By the way, the units could be meters, centimeters, inches, feet. It's usually up to the user to decide what unit of measurement they want to work in. Anyway, our UFO is now at the position 200. Zero, zero. Since we've moved it two units in X, but it still has zero height and zero depth in the scene. Move it up by two units, and it's now located at 2,2,0. .2, Finally, moving it two units forward places it at 2, 2, 2, 2 units horizontally, 2 units vertically, and 2 units forward in depth. As we move away from the origin in the opposite direction, we get negative values. So the horizontal value here will be minus 1. Now, it would be great if everyone agreed on how to label these axes. Unfortunately, like many things in life, that's simply not the case. A common way of labeling the axes is the one we've just seen, X for horizontal, Y for vertical, Z for depth. That's the case for software applications like Maya, Modo, and Nuke. Other applications like 3D Studio Max and Unreal Engine use a Z up, where X remains the horizontal axis, but the depth axis is now labeled Y, and the vertical axis is labeled Z. This is also true of 3D printing, where the 3D printing bed is the XY plane and the vertical lift of the printer is the Z axis. Now, if relabeling of axes wasn't confusing enough, there are also two different kinds of axis coordinate systems, left-handed and right-handed. We've been using a right-handed coordinate system. In a left-hand coordinate system, the direction of the positive depth axis is reversed. Now don't worry, there's an easy way to figure out if an application uses left-handed or right-handed coordinates. Make the corner of a cube with the thumb, pointer, and index fingers of your right hand. Then line your thumb up with the positive direction of the horizontal axis, the direction where numbers increase in the positive direction as you move away from the origin. Now if your index and pointer fingers also point in the positive direction of the other two axes, you have a right-handed coordinate system. If one of them's flipped, you have a left-handed coordinate system. You can confirm this by using the thumb, index, and pointer fingers of your left hand. All three positive axes 
should line up with the direction of your fingers. Now, many 3D applications will have an axis indicator with the positive direction of the axes represented by colored arrows. You can use this to quickly check what kind of handedness your software uses. Now, why does this all matter? Well, most of the time it doesn't matter at all. In fact, if you only ever work in one animation package, you can ignore this information entirely. So why are we telling you all of this? Because chances are you'll have to work in different applications that label their axes differently, and there's a good chance you'll actually have to jump back and forth between them in the course of a single workday. We're trying to keep you from becoming thoroughly confused when you do. So we've talked about moving things in three dimensions, but what about rotating them? Well, rotation is actually fairly simple. Typically, you'll use a rotation system called Euler angles. The easiest way to understand Euler rotation is to think of the three axes as poles you can spin around. So if we rotate around the up axis, which we're calling Y rotation here, our object spins around the Y axis. Rotating around our horizontal X axis spins the object around the X axis, and the Z depth axis, you guessed it, rotates around that axis as if it were a pole. Combining all three rotations, we can rotate an object into any conceivable orientation. Now there is one fundamental problem with Euler rotation, and that's something called gimbal lock. Let's say you rotate the Y axis by 90 degrees. Now when you do, the control for rotating the Z axis now lines up with the control for the X axis. They're stuck now. Rotating the X axis and Z axis produce the same result. In other words, you can now only rotate in two axes instead of three. If you find yourself unable to rotate your object correctly, you may need to reset all the rotation values to 0, 0, 0 and start over. Internally, 3D software can use a different angle system called quaternions to avoid this, but end users will almost always deal with Euler angles, so you'll just live with the occasional gimbal lock. It happens less often than you might think. One last thing on rotation, rotation order matters. You can rotate around X, then Y, then Z, or rotate around Y, then Z, then X, or any combination of the three. The order you apply the rotations will produce different results. As you can see here, when we maintain the same rotation angles, but adjust the order of axis rotation. Most software will tell you its rotation order and allow you to change that order, but if you try to copy rotation values from one software application to another and things are just not lining up, chances are the rotation order is different between the two packages. Now when we move or rotate things in 3D space, there are actually four common reference spaces we can use when moving them. First off, there's world space, which simply means that you're moving the objects relative to the origin of your world. Notice here how the move handles for this object line up with the direction of the world's ground plane grid lines. Now that's fine for some objects, but what if we have something like this car and we want to move side to side or forwards and backwards according to its front, back, top and sides? Well, in that case, you can move it in local space, sometimes called object space. You'll see that the direction of the move handles now lines up with the direction of the car's body and not the world grid lines. There are two other common reference spaces, parent space and screen space. In parent space, you move an object based on its parent's local space. Here we have a sphere with the transform handles pointing to its local space direction, but if we switch to parent mode, we can manipulate based on the orientation of the parent cube. Note that many applications don't have an explicit parent space option, and in those cases, you simply manipulate the parent and the child follows. Parenting is an important concept in 3D animation. It's essential for animating something like a character's arm, where you want the lower arm to rotate from the elbow of the upper arm, and still move with its upper arm parent. And then there's screen space. In screen space, you can move and adjust objects relative to the direction of your screen, your computer's monitor screen, that is. This can be more intuitive sometimes when you have your scene lined up with your screen in a very specific direction. Okay, let's talk about navigating around a scene. 
Most 3D applications create a unique camera called the perspective camera that's your main window into the virtual 3D world you're creating. It's important to understand that when you're navigating through your scene, you're essentially moving this camera around. Everything else in the world stays exactly where it is. Typically, you'll want to pan the camera left, right, up and down, rotate the camera around whatever is currently at the center of your view, and zoom into and out of that view. Now each application has its own way of panning, rotating, and zooming the view, so it would be pointless to try to get any more specific at this point. In addition to perspective cameras, 3D applications include flat orthographic views. These are views without perspective, so the cross sections that are the same length will line up and appear the same length in the viewer. A common layout in 3D applications is to include four individual viewers. One is the traditional perspective camera view, and the other three are orthographic views of an object from the top, the front, and the side. This allows you to make precise measurements of length and angle in the orthographic views while viewing a shaded preview of the image as it would look to the human eye in the perspective view. Applications will often include a hotkey to toggle between a single large view, like the perspective camera, or one of the orthographic views, and the four quadrant views together. In addition to moving your view of the world, you'll obviously want to position objects in the scene. This usually happens by selecting an object by clicking it either in the 3D view or in a list of objects somewhere in the interface, and then using manipulation handles. By dragging directly on the arrows of the manipulation handles, you can constrain movement to a single axis. Alternately, most applications include squares in the manipulation handles that represent a plane of movement, either the ground plane, a vertical plane, or a horizontal plane. Using the orthographic views, you can ensure objects are perfectly aligned to other items in the scene. To rotate an object, you'll typically drag one of the colored axis rings around the object to constrain rotation to that axis. The point in space around which the object rotates is called the pivot point, and 3D applications always have a way to change its location. Finally, scaling an object can usually be done in one dimension, two dimensions, or three dimensions simultaneously by selecting the appropriate on-screen widget. And like rotation, scaling occurs around the pivot point. And that's how you get around in 3D. In the next video, we'll be adding lights and cameras.